Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to another Lockdown LitFest event, where I'm delighted to introduce you to Tom Holland, an award-winning historian, broadcaster, biographer, the author of Rubicon, The Triumphal and Tragedy of the Roman Republic, which won the Hessel Tiltman Prize for History and was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize. Uh, he has uh, translated Herodotus and is currently work on, working on a translation of Suetonius. He's the presenter of BBC Four's Making History, has written and presented a number of TV documentaries for the BBC and Channel 4 on subjects as far ranging as ISIS and dinosaurs. Tom Holland, a very warm welcome to the Lockdown Litfest studio. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you. And as you know, what we're trying to do here is to try to recreate as, as, as accurately as possible a sort of real world literature festival experience. So before we start, I'm sitting in uh, the granny flat of my parents' house in Warwickshire. Whereabouts are you? Uh, I am in Brixton in South London, um, torn between wishing that I was uh, back in my native village in Wiltshire, both because uh, Wiltshire is, is very unaffected by COVID, but also because this is the most beautiful time of the year to be there, but also quite enjoying um, being in London. On Easter um, Sunday, we, we, my wife and I got up very, very early, kind of half past uh, four, and went uh, up, up to the Thames, um, stood on Westminster Bridge to watch the sunrise, and then walked through completely empty London. And, um, you know, it felt like being in War of the Worlds or something, in, 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 or 28 days later, um, an experience of the, of the capital of, of, of a kind that I imagine no one has ever had before. So, you know, there are, there are positives and negatives. Was it spooky? Was it unsettling? Or was it somehow sort of fascinating? It was fascinating, but it was also very, very unsettling because um, it, what, what it, it feels at the moment, the strangeness of all this, that we're living in a plot that we are familiar with. Um, you know, this is the stuff of science fiction and horror. People keep saying it, but they keep saying it because it's, it's true. And, and, and so it was in, in, impossible to walk through a completely empty West End, see everything boarded up, not, not, not see a soul, not even see a car driving, um, and, and, and not feel that you were stuck in some terrifying zombie apocalypse, um, not kind of worry that perhaps some terrible crowd of flesh eaters would be waiting around the corner, I'm glad to say that they weren't, but even so, you know, the, the, the shadow of apocalypse does slightly hang over the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, your nurse, your wife is a, a midwife. How is she doing? She's one of, of course, the NHS heroes that we all clap for at eight o'clock every Thursday, which has become a, a sort of new physical meme of, of, of all, you know, of, up and down the nation. Um, oh, she... we're, we're, we're clapping at her every day <laughs> and making her suffer and waiting on her hand and foot. She is, um, she's at King's. She was formerly, um, she was part of a group practice that meant that she, she went out um, out into the community and ensured that um, every woman when she came to labour would recognise, would know her, her midwife, but that, that's now been completely rationalised, it's much more centralised, it's much more focused on, um, on the wards, um, so uh, she like everyone else in the NHS is, is, is having to adapt, um, but like everyone else in the NHS are doing, doing a wonderful job, I'm very proud of her. Yeah, here to that. Um... This is slightly off topic, but you've been very active on Twitter lately, and I'm a, a loyal follower of your Twitter feed, which not only includes fantastic photographs of zombie apocalypse dawns um, <laughs> in London, uh, but you seem to be conflated with another Tom Holland, which I imagine is driving you to distraction at the minute. Can we nail to bed, nail to rest the, uh, the allegations that you are in fact Spider-Man? Well, I, I don't think I have it as bad as, as poor John Lewis, um, but it's, it's starting to nudge up there. Um, uh, Tom Holland is, of course, the um, brilliantly uh, talented star of the Spider-Man films, um, and as such is the object of a great deal of unrequited love uh, around the world. Um, and so uh, <laughs> every time I look at my Twitter feed, I'm getting offers from kind of teenage girls in Thailand and Argentina or wherever uh, offering to marry me, which uh, on the one hand is, is very flattering, but on the other isn't flattering at all because I know that they've got the wrong person. Um, so it is, it's, it's occasionally a, a slight source of stress, but um, compared to other sources of stress at the current moment, it, it ranks fairly low. I'd have to ask, 
has the Tom Holland 1989 or whatever he is on Twitter reached out to you to apologize or to say, please feed them my way? How, how, there, how, has, has there been any contact? There was, a, there was an interview with him in the Sunday Times, I think about a year ago, where it was, it was broached and he said that he does occasionally get questions about Roman history or something. But I don't think he gets as many questions about Roman history as I get um, offers of marriage from uh, teenage girls. <laughs> There's a hell of an imbalance. Can we come to history? I mean, you are best known on our screens and in print for being a fantastic sort of um, dissector of, of, of classic history, of Roman history. Where did this start? I've given to understand uh, through reading your biography page on your website that it, it could have gone either way. It could have gone dinosaurs or it could have been great empires. Well, actually, you're right to mention dinosaurs. It, it, essentially, I was one of those small boys who was uh, obsessed by dinosaurs. And um, I, I realise now that I was obsessed with them for the same reason that I then seamlessly moved on to an obsession with Rome. Namely, that they were big, they were glamorous, they were fierce, and they were at a kind of safe remove because they were extinct. And I realised that my fascination with Rome was, it's, it's because the Roman Empire is basically the, the Tyrannosaur of antiquity, it's the apex predator. Um, and I remember that the, uh, the, the, the books that I read as a child, the dinosaur books, would always feature um, some theropod slashing to pieces, some unfortunate herbivore, there'd be kind of blood spewing everywhere. Um, and the very first book that I got given about the Romans, it wasn't an Asterix book, um, was also about the conquest of Gaul and featured on the cover a, a, a wonderful illustration um, of the siege of Alasia, which is often name checked in Asterix where it's a joke, but on the cover of this, you've got the full grim reality of what it had meant. It was Caesar's bloodiest, most brilliant victory. Um, he, he was besieging the town of Alasia. Uh, a great army of Gauls comes to the release, so Caesar builds another ring of defensive structures to keep them out. And the cover of this book showed the clash of the Gauls, clash of the Romans, spears going everywhere, blood coming out, and eerily <laughs> recognizable, I now re realize, very familiar um, from uh, the same kind of images of blood, of, of, of savagery, of brutality. And I was just clearly just a very horrible little boy. <laughs> but it, start, I mean, it, it, it seemed to spark in you a deep fascination. One of the things that your books are so fascinating with, or so, so lauded for, is the really deep research you do. When you choose, so let's take you back to Rubicon, the first one, The Triumph and the Tragedy of the Roman Republic. When you're embarking on a book that, that tries to pull apart such a huge task, how do you break down the research? How do you go about it? How do you find something fresh and something about which so much has already been written? Well, the, I think the, 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 fa the fascination with Rome is something that, 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 that accompanies you through your life. So you discover new things as you, as, 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 as you grow up as a person. So my kind of childhood obsession with blood and legions evolved to become, uh, you know, I, I studied, um, uh, Catullus and, 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 and poetry at, at O level, then I studied Cicero's speeches at A level, and gradually I got this kind of sense of the, the complexity, the sophistication, the strangeness and the familiarity of, uh, of Roman civilization. And there were particular, particular aspects of it that, 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 that interested me. And the kind of the aristocratic nexus in the late Republic, the era of Julius Caesar, was absolutely part of that. So when I came to, um, to, to, to write Rubicon, that was really what I was interested in. I was interested in, I suppose in it as a kind of, of, of a mafia film, kind of like The Sopranos, the way in which, um, and I think that, that that's not an entirely tendentious comparison because um, in a way, the kind of the clan structure of um, the Roman Republic is, is not wholly dissimilar to, to, to the way that the mafia organizes itself. So that, that, I thought, provided a kind of inherent sense of drama. And in a sense, chasing up the relationship of all these different clans, the, 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 the kind of the way in which um, a, a, a godfather figure is in command of various other people, the kind of sifting balance of alliances and things like that, there's lots there to research. And it's very, very interesting. And you, you, you know, just enough sources that you can piece it all together. And so that was a kind of an, an inherent degree of fascination. But also, back when I began Rubicon, nobody was writing about Rome. Um, I, I, I got the commission just before Gladiator came out. Oh. So 
uh, just as Gladiator was, um, you know, the first recreation of the sword and sandal epic for, for, for decades, so also I was very lucky when I wrote Rubicon that it was, it was basically the first attempt to write a history aimed at the, the, the general reader for, for, for quite a while. Um, and that gave me the chance to write about what I think is the most thrilling and extraordinary period, not just in ancient history, but pretty much the whole of history, which is the, the implosion of the Roman Republic, because it's a kind of, it's, as I've said, it's a, a story of, of incredible human drama. It's absolutely the Sopranos on the largest stage, but it's also the primal narrative in, in Western history of um, the collapse of a, a republican system of, of government into an autocracy, or if you want to frame it in a different way, the, the kind of the triumph of order over anarchy. Um, and the whole thing was being written against the backdrop of 9-11 and the build up to the, the Gulf War, which of course was a narrative of an imperial republic um, moving into the Middle East and throwing its weight around. Uh, and so I, again, I was writing Rubicon in the conviction that, that actually ancient history wasn't entirely ancient. In a sense, the most recent book I've written, which is about Christianity and about how Christianity emerged as the cuckoo in the ancient nest, is a kind of repudiation of that because over the process of the past 20 years writing about ancient and early medieval history essentially i've the more i've done that the more i've come to feel that actually the romans are not as like us as perhaps when i was writing rubicon i thought that actually they are much much stranger so in a sense dominion is a kind of apologia for, for, for rubicon and yet having said that uh, I, I, I do think that it retain, the story told in Rubicon retains its status as the most thrilling and extraordinary narrative in the whole of history. That's an interesting, very honest thing for you to say, that you're sort of you know, revisiting the views that you had in your first book. What do you now think are the, are the more fund, most fundamental, most key differences uh, between the Romans and us? Well, I suppose on the most basic level, e even when I was writing Rubicon, um, I was... I found myself ashamed that I'd ever kind of identified Julius Caesar as a hero because he, he's much more terrifying than that. Um, and of course, going right the way back to Asterix, the, the, what I now realise is that the extraordinary thing about Asterix is that nobody ever dies in it. Um, you know, the worst that happens is that somebody might end up in a tree with um, kind of stars going around their head. But of course, Actually, the conquest of Gaul was a near genocidal campaign. Um, we're told by a subsequent biographer of Caesar's that a million Gauls were slaughtered, another million were enslaved. And by and large, there were very few people in Rome who worried about this. In fact, on the contrary, they regarded it as, as um, something laud to be lauded, something to be praised. And when Caesar celebrated his triumph over the Gauls, placards would be carried through the streets of Rome, boasting about uh, how many uh, casualties had, be, had been inflicted. And that, of course, is, that's an attitude that seems a, 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 a kind of absolute gulf away from where we are now. And so I, I did begin to ask myself, well, what changed? What was the process of change? But it wasn't only that. It was also the fact that, that lots, you know, lots of things about the Romans that might seem familiar actually a kind of face I mean they are delusory and even on the most fundamental level so attitudes to sex for instance uh, at assumptions about how society should be organized um, assumptions about kind of basic fundamental characteristics like for instance the existence of something called the secular or the existence of something called religion more and more I began to find that, that the very use of English was problematic in writing about ancient Rome, because it required us to use words that would have meant nothing to the Romans, and applying them to Rome generates a kind of anachronism. So if you talk about Roman religion, if you talk about Roman homosexuality, if you talk about the secular in ancient Rome, it's as anachronistic as saying that Julius Caesar conquered France. You're kind of in the right ballpark, but there's something very badly wrong there. And so I think that essentially what changes and essentially what means that the Romans are separated from us by a great chasm is the coming of Christianity. And I think that the reason that 
people may not absolutely recognize that and indeed may, may dig their heels in against that is precisely that we as a civilization, as a society, have been so fundamentally Christianized that we don't even recognize it, this revolution as what it is. That in, in other words, we are, we're, we're like goldfish and the water that we swim in is essentially Christian, but we don't recognize it as such because we don't realize that we're in a goldfish bowl. And so it, it, in that sense, Dominion is an attempt to uh, explore what it is that was so alien about the pre-Christian world and the process by which Christianity emerges from that, reconfigures it, and has, over a process of 2,000 year evolution, pretty radically changed the way that, 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 that we see things and understand things. That's incredibly well put. I mean, I'm, I'm no classicist, as well you know, Tom. Um, but I do remember that it, you know, Constantine was pretty, is, it, you know, in, in, in my education, was the man that Christianized the Roman Empire and took it from a sort of multiplicity of deities. Do you see him, him as a sort of all-conquering hero or as, the, or as, the, or as the, the sower of the seeds that broke the empire? Well, Constantine is, all, is obviously a key figure, but I don't think he is as significant in the history of, of Christianity as perhaps people have tended to think. And the reason for that is that there is inherent within Christianity a profound suspicion of power. Yes. And that's evident right from the very beginning, because the earliest Christian sources we have, the letters of Paul, take for granted that the strangeness of what he is proclaiming, the strangeness of the Christian message, is focused on the fact that Christ was crucified, that he was tortured to death on an implement of torture by Roman power. Mm. And the cross to the Romans was the preeminent emblem of their right to torture to death anyone who opposed them. What Paul does and what Christians do over the course of the centuries that follow Paul is to recalibrate the cross as an image of the triumph of the defenseless over those who torture the defenseless, the triumph of the powerless over the powerful, and therefore by extension the triumph of imperial subjects over the empire itself. And the fact that Constantine converts the empire to Christianity to a degree palliates the impact of that, but not entirely. And so over the course of Christian history, and particularly the history of, of Latin Christendom, precisely because in the western half of the Roman Empire, Roman power implodes, it melts away, it, 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 it chatters. And an imperial structure, although there are repeated attempts to try and construct one, never really kind of beds down in the scale that you get in Constantinople or in Baghdad or, you know, even more in, in, in China and Japan. So there is scope within Latin Christendom for this inherent suspicion of power that has existed in Christianity right from the beginning to kind of bed down. And that expresses itself over the course of the Middle Ages in an assumption that's become fundamental to us. I've talked about how the idea of there being secular and religious dimensions is very alien to the Romans. It's not a, a category they would have understood. The fact that we have it reflects the fact that over the course of the Middle Ages, the idea that the dimension of the supernatural, the dimension of the holy, the dimension of what you, we, we come to call the religious can be separated from something that can be called what the Romans called the cyclone, the dimension of, of, of the limit of human memory, the limit, the, the flux of things. This beds down and it means that what comes to be called the secular, the, 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 the realm of kings and emperors and then in due course of presidents and of prime ministers, that suspicion of their power always exists. And indeed, a suspicion of the power of the church as well, because the, 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 the church over the course of the Middle Ages becomes sufficiently powerful that it generates a further cycle of, of uh, what in Latin is called reformatio, what in, in English comes to be called reformation. And the Protestant Reformation is an attempt to bring down the power of, of, what, they, of what the reformers called the Roman church. In turn, in the 18th century, this suspicion of power that is bred of Christianity comes to be turned against Christianity itself. So with the Enlightenment, 
with the French Revolution in due course with the Russian Revolution and then into the present day with the, um, the insistence of humanists and secularists that religion is something to be suspected, something that constitutes uh, superstition, something to be banished. And so this whole cycle of suspicion of power, suspicion of authority, is absolutely a corollary of the Christian character of our civilization. And it's one that, that Constantine himself and his, the, heir, the, the kind of Christian emperors, the Christian kings, the Christian authorities, the Christian powers that have succeeded him, have never entirely been able to su suppress. And so to that degree, our entire civilization, by being raised on Christian foundations, is kind of like San Francisco being raised on the San Andreas Fault. It's, you know, it's, it's, it might seem stable for, for decades, perhaps for centuries, but you know that every so often you are going to get a great convulsion and the structures of authority are going to be sent toppling. And the paradox of, of, of the contemporary West which might imagine that it's, it's kind of repudiated Christianity, is that that repudiation of Christianity is itself an expression of Christian impulses, That's of true. the conviction, the Christian conviction, the conviction articulated by Christ himself, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's an extraordinary thesis. It, 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 it puts so many questions into my mind, not least of all, we're, we're, of course, I think you say at one point that, that we stand at the end point of this extraordinary transformation, the understanding of what it is to be human. Of course, it is with this sort of this weaving of Christianity right through us. Do you do you think that we are at the, at the I mean, we're all talking about sort of an end of times sort of paradigm at the minute? Do you think that there's a big shift about to come in the relationship in our relationship with religion? whether Christianity or Islam, which you've also written up, and how that interfaces with politics and with society moving forward? Um, I, I, I think that the 60s probably are a, a, a period of, of convulsion that maybe in 100, 200 years time will, will, will seem on a parallel with maybe the first decade of the Reformation. As a, as a period of, of, of change and transformation. Really? But just as, as in the Reformation, um, the, the reformers were not entirely repudiating what had gone before. In fact, they were kind of drawing on the same wellsprings of Christian inheritance as the, as the, 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 the Catholic Church had done. So likewise, the impulse within the movement of the 60s was not entirely, al al although it set itself against what it saw as the kind of the repressive character of, of uh, Christian civilization was it, it, the impulse for doing that was in self-drawing on Christian wellsprings. Um, so to that extent I think that um, our society in the West remains kind of shot through with deeply rooted Christian uh, assumptions, prejudices, um, things that uh, and should not be taken for granted at all. However, having said that, um, there clearly is a kind of process of fraying now um, on a greater scale than, than, than perhaps has, has, has happened since, um, since the age of Constantine. Um, and so I think that opens up really kind of three possibilities for, for us. The first is that um, perhaps um, liberal humanism, secular humanism, whatever you want to call it, um, will just carry on, that it's become self-sustaining, that if you like, um, you could imagine it, that the, um, the, 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 the Christianity was kind of like the, the rocket boosters required to get it through the atmosphere. And now, um, now it's gone through the atmosphere, it can just get rid of the boosters and can just float on through space. So perhaps, you know, liberal humanism, secularism, will be self-sustaining it'll it'll be fine it doesn't need the kind of the um the seedbed of christianity to nurture it to sustain its roots um alternatively perhaps liberal secular humanism does perhaps because because its assumptions are myths uh it's assumptions that we you know all humans have an inherent dignity that there are things like human rights um, all of these are, are, are myths they're not givens at all and perhaps without the, uh, the, the mythic potency of, of, of Christianity, they will simply wither and die. And um, 
we will return to uh, a, a much more pre-Christian understanding in which it's power that is um, lauded, power and, and wealth and authority. And the assumption that uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first will be jettisoned. Um, and we've already had a flavor of what that world might be like with fascism. So perhaps the future is a kind of soft post-Christian form of fascism. Or perhaps um, we, as a, as a culture, will come to recognize that precisely that the assumptions of, of, of liberal humanism are mythic. Uh, we will also come to recognize that they are not remotely universal in a world that is um, increasingly in the shadow of, of China, of uh, the Asian powers. Um, we'll come to recognize that things that we, in our heyday, in our pomp, in our arrogance, assumed were universal to all of humanity are in fact very culturally contingent and perhaps then we will come to return to our own wellsprings and we will discover that they're christian and perhaps there will be a process of re-christianization i don't know which of those three paths we, 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 we will end up following but i suspect that we will be going along one of them we mentioned Islam in this because you've written about Islam in the past. You've done a lot of research of Islam. Where, where do you see Islam, the rise of Islam, of Wahhabist Islam specifically, um, in these sort of three, three options that you are presenting for the future? Well, I, th I think that um, in, in Dominion, I quote an Indian scholar who says that um, Christianization proceeds in two ways. It proceeds in conversion, which is the obvious one that everyone thinks about, uh, but also that it proceeds through secularization. And what he means by that is that Europeans, Christian Europeans over the, the, the period of their imperial heyday, exported the idea of the secular, um, not consciously, but rather like they exported microbes. It was just kind of, it came, it was part of the kind of inheritance that they took with them. They didn't realize that they were doing it. So that when the, the British went to India and they exported their idea of the secular, they ended up creating the idea of there being religions in India. It's, you know, the, 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 uh, the word Hinduism is, 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 it's the British who originated. There's no equivalent in any Indian language. Um, and something rather similar happens with, with, with Islam because Europeans assume that Islam is a religion like Christianity and therefore exists kind of counter to something called the secular. And this is something that Muslims who have, have moved to Europe in, in the wake of the Second World War have been forced basically to, to, to take on board as part of the condition of being European or, or American or Western citizens. Um, the, the, the pact in European, in Western states, is that Muslims, like Jews, like Hindus, have to accept that they belong to something called a religion. And to that extent, they have freedom of religion. They are allowed to practice their religion. But what they're not allowed to do is to assume that the division between the secular and the religious, which is this inheritance of Christianity, is something that can be dissolved. And there are, of course, Muslims who want to do that, who want to go back to the way that Muslims took things for granted in the, the, the pre-European imperial age, where the idea that there were things called religions, an idea that there were things, a state called the secular, meant nothing to them. This was an entirely Christian category. So, the idea that Islam exists separate from the secular, if, if you as a Muslim accept that, to a degree, you've been Christianized. Right. And so we can see that, that you know, the, the Salafi, Salafism, the desire to kind of um, reject the idea of the secular, the idea to uh, institute a, a, a global caliphate, um, this is a reaction against what I think they either inchoately or overtly see as the, the fact that, that, that Islam has been Christianized. Um, but there's a problem because when we, when we describe this as fundamentalism, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that the reaction of, of Muslims to this process is again following in the tram lines of Christians because the original fundamentalists were not Muslims, 
but were Protestants who were reacting against the, what they felt as the kind of the excessive claims of secularists. Um, and the Christian fundamentalism is an entirely 20th century phenomenon. It's a kind of emphasis on, on a kind of literal, slightly brittle response to, uh, to, to the secular. And Muslim fundamentalism is following in the same way. So essentially the problem I think for, um, for people across the world who do not subscribe to, 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 to Christianity is how do you get rid of this kind of Christian influence? And, and, and I compared um, uh, earlier the, the, the metaphor of Christianization to, 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 to goldfish in a goldfish bowl. But there was another one that struck me in the wake of a um, of, of finishing Dominion, which came from watching the um, uh, Chernobyl, the drama series. Yeah. Where in that film, if you're up, two of the lead characters are right up close to the power station watching the radioactivity leak, and you can see it because the air is being ionized. But of course, the impact of the radioactive leak from Chernobyl is felt by people who can't actually see it. It impacts, you know, Kiev and it impacts Scandinavia and it impacts hill farms in, in Cumbria and all kinds of places. And you don't recognize that it's happening to you. And I think that, that the impact of Christianity around the world has been rather like that, that it's changed the way that Muslims and Hindus and all kinds of people understand how they practice and what they are. But they may not even realize that the, 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 the way that it's been changed is a, ref is, is, is a response to the Christian character of the empires that colonized them in the 19th century and which, which dominated the way that the world thought about itself and structured its governance in the 20th century. The frameworks of the United Nations, the governing assumptions of international law, the fact that countries as various as Turkey and India and Japan define themselves in their constitutions as secular. All of these are, 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 are bear, ever, bear witness to the Christian character of the hegemonic powers in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and also explains, of course, why, um, by, why Western powers are so reluctant to, to recognize that ideas like the human rights, ideas like the secular might be inherently Christian, because if they do that, then immediately they become less inherently universal. So, I mean, I have to say this, if you were to sit down in front of Marcus Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, and put forward this thesis, this hypothesis to him, what sort of reaction do you think he'd come back with? Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, he's, he's uh, as Archbishop of Canterbury, he, of course, um, is heir to um, the imperial expansion of Christianity uh, sure. under the British Empire. So I'm sure he must um, reflect on these issues a, a good deal. Um, but for Archbishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury, as for the, for, for, for the Pope, as for, um, you know, uh, the apparatchiks of the United Nations, there is, there is a, 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 a nervousness about the fact that um, the kind of the universal claims of the Church of England, uh, sorry, of, uh, not the Church of England, of Anglicanism, yeah. of the Catholic Church, and of the United Nations are founded on the idea that there is a kind of universal truth that uh, is there for all of humanity. Um, the possibility that that might not be the case is increasingly going to be a shadow that falls over Western complacency and the Western assumption that their values, that our values are universal. I, I, I think that they're not. Uh, and I think that we are going to be brought up against that more and more over the course of the 21st century as Western power recedes and as Asian power rises. And we can see that process happening now. Exactly. Um, I know that you don't shy away from controversy and you firmly believe what your research shows you and what you write. Are you expecting this to be a controversial book? Certainly not as, as controversial as the book I wrote on the origins of Islam, which really was um, prodding a hornet's nest. Um, I, I, when, I, when I wrote that, because in, in, uh, in the Shadow of the Sword book on early Islam I wrote, I was, um, I, I was questioning the foundation myths of what, Mus uh, of what Muslims believe. Yes. And there were, there were various Muslims who responded to that by saying, well, you would never do that to your own beliefs. And in a sense, 
Dominion is an attempt to, to do to my beliefs what, um, uh, what, what, what I was doing in the, in the Shadow of the Short Sword to, uh, to, to Muslim beliefs, because I, when I looked at, at my assumptions, which were broadly um, humanist, liberal, I looked to, um, to, to the Enlightenment, and then before that to uh, classical antiquity, as being the, the seedbed of my ideals, um, I, I realized that that was a myth. Um, and so everything about the Enlightenment basically derives from Christian assumptions. It's a, it's, it's a recalibration of the Protestant uh, Reformation. The Protestant Reformation in turn is a recalibration of the initial process of Christianization. So it goes back an incredibly long way. And I, I now recognize that in my, pretty much all my values, beliefs, assumptions, ideologies, I'm, I'm essentially Christian. Um, that is a, a, a perspective that those who are very ideologically humanist, those who would ideologically say that they are, are that their values are founded on the Enlightenment, that it, it, are hostile to. But I think that it, it seems transparent to me um, that to reject superstition, to uh, claim that you're toppling idolatry, to insist that you want to bring people in darkness into light, this is just a recalibrate, as I say, a recalibration of Protestantism. And ultimately, it's, it's uh, a reworking of ideas and myths that ultimately go back even before Christianity to the, to the Hebrew prophets. It's Isaiah who talks about um, the people who, who walked in darkness. Uh, seeing a great light. Um, and to that extent, I, the society I live in, uh, certainly doctrinaire humanists, are all just, um, you know, we're, 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 we're twigs on the great tree that has its roots deep in the subsoil of, uh, of the Hebrew prophets. Now there's a hell of a metaphor. There's no easy way to segue from what we've been discussing to what I would like to talk about now. So I'm just going to say it in one word. No, in fact, a number of words. Are you missing cricket, Tom? Oh, so badly. So badly. And, and, and the, the, um, the beauty of the weather, <laughs> the, the smell of, you know, fresh grass in the air is a kind of torture. Um, we, I, I play a, a huge amount. I play... Um, for a team called the Authors, which um, was originally founded um, back in the the Edwardian period by Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, Jerome K. Jerome and J. M. Barry and all kinds of luminaries like that, and I've been playing for them for the past eight years, and uh, we have an amazing fixture list drawn up by our, our wonderful captain, um, which is due to start um, Friday week, and it doesn't look like we're going to be playing. Uh, and I know that next Friday I'm going, it will probably be the most depressing day for me of the entire lockdown so far. Unless, of course, I've uh, caught something by that point. But, you know. Let's hope not. And let's pay respect to Charlie, who, uh, who pulls the Authors, authors 11 together. Um, I have to say, I once played uh, for the Authors 11, by which I mean I played just the once, unfortunately. You were brilliant. You were brilliant. I was so not, uh, which is hence the once. But Tom is a fantastic <laughs> cricketer. It is a very, it, you know, it is a sad time, not just for cricketers, but for you know, sportsmen all over. Um, and you can't really uh, sort of do nets in your kitchen, can you? Or have you tried? Uh, well, I've got two daughters whose, whose lack of um, interest in cricket is on a cosmic scale. <laughs> so I, unfortunately, I don't have anyone to play with me. Um, but I was, I was thinking that I might um, do a series of batting masterclasses in the garden. And I, oh, might, I, nice I, I might I might enslave a daughter and uh, get her to throw balls at me and film it. And where would you put those out? Oh, I don't know. Well, can we offer? Can we offer? I, I, I should I, I should um, I should let you know I'm a terrible batsman. Let me, well, a good deal. Let it would be a fair element of self parody in it. It's not beyond the wit of us here at Lockdown Lit Fest, and um, although I'm I'm sort of. You know, the one that you're seeing on your screen right now, there is a whole team of brilliant people behind me to invoke the sports tent. Perhaps you'd like to inaugurate it with your batting masterclasses. Uh, well, maybe we could talk after this interview. That would be great. I would love to invoke the power of technology. Let's do that. Tom, thank you so much for joining us here at the Lockdown Lit Fest. It's been a pleasure to see you. I'm pleased yourself safe and well. Uh, please give all our love to your heroic wife. Uh, oh, well. 
ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, we, Tom has largely been talking about his latest book uh, called Dominion, which is just a fantastic piece of work, as you would expect from such a dedicated and committed communicator of history. Uh, he really puts things in context. Um, and this one ranges from the Persian invasion of Greece of 480 BC to the ongoing migration crisis in Europe, and from Nebuchadnezzar to the Beatles. And what is not to love about that? You will see beneath this screen a buy the book button. Uh, and if you are, have been at all interested in what Tom has been saying, what we'll be discussing, can we point you to that direction? Thank you so very much for joining us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As ever, we hope you are well. We all of us hope you are keeping safe and uh, we hope you're being very careful. Thank you very much indeed. Cheerio.